Prepare our hearts and minds, O oh God, for the reading of your holy word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your guidance for us this day and follow that guidance faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture reading for today. John 3, 1 to 12 and 16 to 17. Today we continue our journey through the gospel according to John. We meet up with Jesus in Jerusalem during the Jewish festival of Passover. Today we are re our reading is John 3 to 1 to 12, 16 to 17, which shares with us Jesus' late night conversation with a Jewish leader named Nicodemus. Let us listen together for God's word to us today as Pastor Kendra reads the words of Nicodemus and I read the words of Jesus. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. How can these things be? Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Thanks be to God for this reading of God's word. As we turn to reflect on it, please pause for prayer with me. O oh, Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it must be share about childhood day, because like Pastor Laura, I want to begin by sharing a memory uh, from years gone by. I don't have any cute pictures of childhood, though. I'll have to save those for next time. But I have this formative memory that goes all the way back to summers I spent uh, at the benefit of my grandparents who would gift me for several years with a week at a Christian summer camp. And one summer, after hearing a certain Bible verse over and over again for probably the third or fourth summer in a row, my impressionable, wanting to please others self, decided it was finally, it was best to finally invest in the camp store in the brand new, yet oddly rustic looking plywood wall plaque that was emblazoned with this particular verse. So for several years thereafter, the words of John 3.16 hung above the coat tree in my bedroom. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only son that, so that everyone who believes in him 
may not perish, but have eternal life. Perhaps some of you have your own memories of formative or first encounters with this verse, one of the most widely quoted in all of scripture. It appears not only on wall plaques, but also on coffee mugs, billboards, t-shirts, cross-stitch samplers, and more. I've sometimes heard it called the gospel in a nutshell, and that's certainly how it was presented to me all those summers at camp along with lots of talk about needing to be born again. What either didn't stick in my head or wasn't shared at camp was the original context of Jesus' now famous words and call to be born again. I'm not sure I even recognized the name of Jesus' late night visitor, Nicodemus, until I was in seminary, to be honest. But as with so many things, context matters. And it's only been by digging more deeply into Jesus' late night conversation with Nicodemus that I've come to understand what caused the uneasiness I often felt at camp all those years ago. At camp and in other venues that I frequented as a child and young teen, what was emphasized most when talking about John 3.16 was individual belief. I personally needed to believe something, which fairly clearly meant that I needed to affirm intellectually a certain set of doctrines or truths about Jesus so that I might individually be born again or saved from perishing when my earthly life came to an end. Many would share their stories of being born again, some distinct moment in time when they claimed Jesus intellectually as their savior and were forever changed. While there's nothing wrong with such a moment in time conversion experience, it wasn't and isn't my experience. And, as we, and if we read Jesus' words in the context of his conversation with Nicodemus, it becomes clear that Jesus wasn't just interested in individuals being born again and embracing eternal life. That was Jesus' dream for whole communities, for the whole world. Nicodemus was a Pharisee or a prominent Jewish leader, as John tells us. And as we read, he comes at night to inquire more of this Jesus because he has caught Nicodemus's attention Nicodemus comes, I believe, in good faith, for he greets Jesus, affirming that Jesus must be from God. For how else would Jesus be able to do the amazing things that Nicodemus has seen and heard Jesus doing? In response to Nicodemus's faithful greeting, Jesus doesn't waste time. Jesus wants Nicodemus to grow. So Jesus cuts right to the chase and says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. That Greek word that's here translated born from above can also be translated born again or born anew. But none of these nuances seem to strike Nicodemus just right for he immediately expresses confusion asking how someone can physically be born again after growing old. <laughs> Jesus is patient, as Pastor Laura said, and then tries to clarify by distinguishing between physical birth and spiritual birth or rebirth. In so doing, Jesus says, do not be astonished that I said to you, you, as in you all, must be born from above. 
as Jesus rephrases what he said at the outset, that one key word, you, the plural you or y'all, reveals what was and is so easily missed. Jesus' core message isn't a call for just for individuals to be born again so that they can be saved from some punishment when their earthly life, end, earthly life ends. Jesus is calling for the whole community to be born again so that all can experience and see the kingdom of God, God's dreams come into being here and now. It may begin with individual transformation, but the goal is community transformation. Not surprisingly, even with Jesus' clarification, Nicodemus remains confused or perhaps reticent. After all, as theologian Debbie Thomas writes, what Jesus was offering Nicodemus was not a tune-up or a few tweaks to an already near-perfect life. Jesus was offering Nicodemus a brand new life, a new birth, a fresh down-to-the-foundations beginning. And what newborn enters the world without birth pangs, shock, disorientation or pain. And as Nicodemus no doubt knows, it's hard enough to imagine individuals leaning into the hard, vulnerable, often painful and stretching work of beginning again from the very foundations Trying to imagine an entire community doing that hard work is even more of a stretch. With Nicodemus, we too might ask, how can these things be? How do we even begin to seek such transformation for ourselves, for our communities, for the whole world? Well, maybe this is where we circle back to that famous verse with which we began. And maybe we start by reframing this idea of belief. If Jesus promises that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life, then understanding what believing really means is key. In her book, Christianity After Religion, historian Diana Butler Bass points out that in early English usage, the word believe when used religiously carried roughly the same meaning as its German cousin believen, which means to prize, to treasure, to hold dear, and comes from the root word liebe or love. So in this way, in early English, to believe was to belove something or someone as an act of trust or loyalty. In other words, to believe is not to hold an opinion or to intellectually claim certain things about who Jesus is. To believe is to treasure to hold something beloved, to give one's heart over to something without reservation, to invest it with one's love. Believing is not holding, claiming, or possessing an opinion or idea about God. Believing is cherish, cherishing, loving, trusting in, and devoting ourselves to God and to God's vision for the world. As Debbie Thomas writes, for, Dick, for Nicodemus, believing in this way meant starting anew, letting go of all he thought he understood about the life of faith. It meant becoming a newborn, vulnerable, hungry, and ready to receive reality in a brand new way. This work of trusting Jesus 
It's mind bending, soul altering work. It is hard and it takes time and it involves setbacks, fears, and disappointments. But it is the work to which we are all together called, just like Nicodemus and his community. Because in our rebirth, our collective letting go of old ways and of knowing and believing, and in our collective deeper trust and embrace of God's work among us, that is where, as Jesus promised, we will see and experience the kingdom of God come among us, God's dreams growing and flourishing in our midst here and now not just in some far off future. So the choice is before us this day and each day, just as it was before Nicodemus all those nights ago. Are we willing? Are we ready to let go a bit and lean together? into new levels of trust, new levels of devotion, to love come down, Christ among us. Are we ready to learn and grow anew, just as a newborn does, one day at a time, one moment at a time, taking in each new thing, trusting that the parent God who created us and gave us life will not let us go, trusting that the promise of God's kingdom, of God's dreams, of a world of justice, peace, and love is for us and for all here and now. Friends, it may be hard work, it may be a lifetime of work, but I trust that we can do it together. So by God's grace, may we dare to believe, to ever more fully be love our God. May we dare to be born anew, not just as individuals, but as a community. And in doing so, may God's glory and dreams be ever more fully known. Thanks be to God. Amen.